In this part, you may learn to fashion the tools by which you may build for yourself any condition you desire. If you wish to change conditions, you must change yourself. Your whims, your wishes, your fancies, your ambitions may be thwarted at every step, but your inmost thoughts will find expression just as certainly as the plant springs from seed. Suppose then we desire to change conditions. How are we to bring about this? The reply is simple, by the law of growth. Cause and effect are as absolute and undeviating in the hidden realm of thought as in the world of material things. Hold in mind the condition desired. Affirm it as an already existing fact. This indicates the value of a powerful affirmation. By constant repetition, it becomes a part of ourselves. We are actually changing ourselves. We're making ourselves what we want to be. Character is not a thing of chance, but it is the result of continued effort. If you are timid, vacillating, self-conscious, or if you are over-anxious or harassed by thoughts of fear or impending danger, remember that it is axiomatic that the two things cannot exist in the same place at the same time. Exactly the same thing is true in the mental and spiritual world, so that your remedy is plainly to substitute thoughts of courage, power, and self-reliance, as well as confidence, for those of fear, lack, and limitation. The easiest and most natural way to do this is to select an affirmation which seems to fit your particular case. The positive thought will destroy the negative as certainly as light destroys darkness, and the results will be just as effectual. Act is the blossom of thought, and conditions are the result of action, so that you constantly have in your possession the tools by which you will certainly and inevitably make or unmake yourself, and joy or suffering will be the reward. Part 9. There are only three things which can possibly be desired in the world without, and each of them can be found in the world within. The secret of finding them is simply to apply the proper mechanism of attachment to the omnipotent power to which each individual has access. The three things which all mankind desires and which are necessary for his highest expression and complete development are health, wealth, and love. All will admit that health is absolutely essential, so no one can be happy if the physical body is in pain. All will not so readily admit that wealth is necessary, but all must admit that a sufficient supply at least is necessary, and what would be considered sufficient for one would be considered absolute and painful lack for another. And as nature provides, not only enough, but abundantly, wastefully, lavishly, we realize that any lack or limitation is only the limitation. All will probably admit that love is the third, or maybe some will say the first, essential, necessary to the happiness of mankind. At any rate, those who possess all three, health, wealth, and love, find nothing else which can be added to their cup of happiness. We have found that the universal substance is all health, all substance, and all love, and that the mechanism of attachment whereby we can consciously connect with this infinite supply is in our method of thinking. To think correctly is therefore to enter into the secret place of the Most High. But what shall we think? If we know this, we shall have found the proper mechanism of attachment which will relate to us. Whatsoever things we desire, this mechanism may seem very simple when I give it to you, but read on. You will find that it is in reality the master key, the Aladdin's lamp, if you please. You'll find that it's the foundation, the imperative condition, the absolute law of well-doing, which means well-being. To think correctly and accurately, we must know the truth. The truth, then, is the underlying principle in every business or social relation. It's a condition precedent to every right action. To know the truth, to be sure, to be confident, affords a satisfaction beside which no other is at all comparable. It is only the solid ground in a world of doubt, conflict, and danger. To know the truth is to be in harmony with the infinite and omnipotent power. To know the truth is, therefore, to connect yourself with a power which is irresistible and which will sweep away every kind of discord, in harmony, doubt, or error of any kind, because the truth is mighty, and it will prevail. The humblest intellect can readily foretell the result of any action when he knows that it is based on truth. But the mightiest intellect, the most profound and penetrating mind, loses its way hopelessly, and can form no conception of the results which may ensue when his hopes are based on a premise which he knows to be false. Every action which is not in harmony with truth, whether through ignorance or design, will result in discord and eventual loss in proportion to its extent and character. How then are we to know the truth in order to attach this mechanism which will relate us to the infinite? 
Uh, we can make no mistake about this. If we realize the truth is the vital principle of the universal mind and is omnipresent. For instance, if you require health, a realization of the fact that the I in you is spiritual and that all spirit is one, that wherever a part is the whole must be, will bring about a condition of health. Because every cell in the body must manifest the truth as you see it. If you see sickness, they will manifest sickness. If you see perfection, they must manifest perfection. The affirmation that I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy will bring about harmonious conditions. The reason for this is because the affirmation is in strict accordance with the truth. And when truth appears, every form of error or discord must necessarily disappear. Now you found that the I is spiritual. It must be necessarily then always be no less than perfect. The affirmation, I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy, is therefore an exact scientific statement. Thought is a spiritual activity, and spirit is creative. Therefore, the result of holding this thought in mind must necessarily bring about conditions in harmony with the thought. If you require wealth, a realization of the fact that the I in you is one with the universal mind, which is all substance and is omnipotent, will assist you in bringing into operation the law of attraction, which will bring you into vibration with those forces which make for success and bring about conditions of power and affluence in direct proportion with the character and purpose of your affirmation. Visualization is the mechanism of the attachment which you require. Visualization is a very different process from seeing. Seeing is physical, and it's therefore related to the objective world, the world without but visualization is a product of the imagination and is therefore a product of the subjective mind, the world within. It is therefore possessing vitality and it will grow. The thing visualized will manifest itself in form. The mechanism is perfect. It was created by the master architect who doeth all things well. But unfortunately, sometimes the operator is inexperienced or inefficient, but practice and determination will overcome this deficit. If you require love, try to realize that the only way to get love is by giving it. That the more you give, the more you'll get. And the only way in which you can give it is to fill yourself with it until you become a magnet. The method was explained in another lesson. He who has learned to bring the greatest spiritual truth into touch with the so-called lesser things of life has discovered the secret of the solution of his problem. One is always quickened, made more thoughtful, by his nearness of approach to great ideas, great events, great natural objects, and great men. Lincoln is said to have begotten in all who came near him the feeling awakened when one approaches a mountain, and this sense asserts itself most keenly when one comes to realize that he has laid hold upon things that are eternal, the power of truth. It is sometimes an inspiration to hear from someone who has actually put these principles to the test, someone who has demonstrated them in their own life. A letter from Frederick Andrews offers the following insight. I was about 13 years old when Dr. T.W. Marcy, since passed over, said to my mother, There is no possible chance, Mrs. Andrews, I lost my little boy the same way, after doing everything for him that it was possible to do. I've made a special study of these cases, and I know there is no possible chance for him to get well. She turned to him and said, Doctor, what would you do if he were your boy? And he answered, I would fight. Fight as long as there's a breath of life to fight for. That was the beginning of a long, drawn-out battle with many ups and downs, the doctors all agreeing that there was no chance for a cure, though they encouraged and cheered us the best they could. But at last the victory came, and I've grown from a little crooked, twisted cripple going about on my hands and knees to a strong, straight, well-formed man. Now, I know you want the formula, and I'll give it to you as briefly and quickly as I can. I build up an affirmation for myself taking the qualities I most needed and affirming for myself over and over. I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. I kept up this affirmation always the same, never varying until I could wake up in the night and find myself repeating, I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. It was the last thing on my lips at night and the first thing in the morning. Not only did I affirm it for myself, but I affirmed it for others that I knew needed it. I want to emphasize this point. Whatever you desire for yourself, affirm it for others, and it will help you both. We reap what we sow. If we send out thoughts of love and health, they return to us like bread cast upon the waters. 
But if we send out thoughts of fear, worry, jealousy, anger, hate, etc., we're going to reap the results in our own lives. It used to be said that man is completely built over every seven years. But some scientists now declare that we build ourselves over entirely every 11 months, so we are really only 11 months old. If we build the defects back into our body year after year, we have no one to blame but ourselves. So man is the sum total of his own thoughts. So the question is, how are we going to entertain only the good thoughts and reject the evil ones? At first, we can't keep the evil thoughts from coming, but we can keep from entertaining them. The only way to do this is to forget them, which means get something for them. This is where the ready-made affirmation comes into play. When a thought of anger, jealousy, fear, or worry creeps in, just start your affirmation going. The way to fight darkness is with light. The way to fight cold is with heat. The way to overcome evil is with good. For myself, I never could find any help in denials. Affirm the good and the bad will vanish. Signed, Frederick Elias Andrews. If there's anything you require, it will be well for you to make use of this affirmation. It cannot be improved upon. Use it just as it is. Take it into the silence with you until it sinks into your subconsciousness. That way you can use it anywhere, in your car, in the office, at home. This is the advantage of spiritual methods. They are always available. Spirit is omnipresent, ever ready, and all that is required is a proper recognition of its omnipotence and a willingness or desire to become the recipient of its beneficent efforts. If our predominant mental attitude is one of power, courage, kindliness, and sympathy, we shall find that our environment will reject conditions in correspondence with these thoughts. If it is weak, critical, envious, and destructive, we shall find our environment reflecting conditions corresponding to these thoughts. Thoughts are causes and conditions are effects. Herein is the explanation of the origin of both good and evil. Thought is creative and will automatically correlate with its object. This is a cosmological law, a universal law. The law of attraction, the law of cause and effect, the recognition and application of this law will determine both beginning and end. It is by the law by which in all ages and in all times the people were led to believe in the power of prayer. As thy faith is, so be it unto thee. It's simply another shorter and better way of stating it. So this week visualize a plant. Take a flower, the one you most admire. Bring it from the unseen into the seen. Plant the tiny seed, water it, care for it. Place it where it will get the direct rays of the morning sun. See the seed burst. It is now a living thing. Something which is alive and beginning to search for the means of substance. See the roots penetrating the earth. Watch them shoot out in all directions. And remember that they are living cells, dividing and subdividing, and that they will soon number millions, that each cell is intelligent, that it knows what it wants and knows how to get it. See the stem shoot forward and upward. Watch it burst through the surface of the earth. See it divide and form branches. See how perfect and symmetrical each branch is formed. See the leaves begin to form, and then the tiny stems, each one holding aloft a bud. And as you watch, you see the bud begin to unfold, and your favorite flower comes to view. And now, if you will concentrate intently, you'll become conscious of a fragrance. It's the fragrance of the flower as the breeze gently sways the beautiful creation which you have just visualized. When you are enabled to make your decision and vision clear and complete, you'll be enabled to enter into the spirit of a thing. It will become very real to you. You will be learning to concentrate, and the process is the same whether you're concentrating on help, a favorite flower, an ideal, a complicated business proposition, or any other problem of life. And remember, every success has been accomplished by persistent concentration upon the object in view. If you get 